Good evening, everybody. I'm Megan Castillo. I'm Town Hall's program manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream conversation with political relations expert Andrew Embry and former White House communications director Jen Saki. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institute stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Andrew and Jen for appearing tonight to make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include acclaimed historian Jill Lepore detailing the forgotten history of the Simulmatics Corporation and data mining. Michael Denzel Smith about reckoning with who we are as a country and who we want to be. Haley Tayathi discussing their indigenous land acknowledgement art for Town Hall and more. Town Hall is the nonprofit and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the event cancellations and the ever changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and can use your support as well. If you're interested in supporting local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through Elliott Bay Books. For viewers who wanna watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing this stream via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button at the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about 40 minutes followed by Q&A. Andrew and Jen will select questions from those submitted in the ask a question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions will be addressed by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Andrew Embry is a senior fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology. He served as a speechwriter and advisor to Secretary of State John Kerry and as a professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He teaches foreign policy on speech writing and rhetoric to graduate and undergraduate students at Georgetown University. Jen Saki is the Vice President of Communications and Strategy at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a CNN political commentator. She was formerly the White House Communications Director and State Department Spokesperson. Andrew's book, Power on the Precipice, The Six Choices America Faces in a Turbulent World, is the topic of tonight's conversation. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Embry and Jen Saki. Thank you so much. Well, I am so thrilled to be here with Andrew. I have a copy of his book, which I encourage everybody to, of course, purchase through the link that was mentioned. And I also encourage you to click the button at the bottom of your screen where you can ask a question because we will be taking as many questions as we can uh, after we uh, finish our portion of the conversation. So let me start, Andrew. Um, many of the people watching may not know you yet. Uh, they will once they read your book, but you're the son of a Foreign Service Officer, your father, and, and the son of a journalist, your mother. Tell us how that impacted your view of the world. Well, I'm first say I'm so happy to be here with, with you, Jen, uh, and with the whole Town Hall Seattle community. I think everyone watching, I just share briefly that I got to know Jen traveling with her around the world uh, with Secretary Kerry on, on the Secretary's plane. And I always say, if you really wanna get to know somebody, put them in this plane, traveling for 10 days, two weeks at a time, little food, little <laughs> sleep, uh, and it really reveals someone's character. And for me, Jen is just an example of grace under pressure. Uh, she treated everybody with such uh, kindness and respect. And I always marveled 
at her ability to go off the plane from a long trip or an intense negotiation and still take the podium, deliver the message of the United States with, with such care and skill uh, and clarity. And it was, it was always impressive because for us speechwriters, our job was done once we finished the speech draft, but Jen had to go in front of the cameras and I was always uh, marveled at her, at her abilities. So it's really a treat to be here with her. And I'm really excited to be here with the, the Town Hall Seattle community. Uh, it's a special moment, but it's also, I know, a very difficult uh, and somber moment for everybody on the West Coast uh, dealing with the, the devastating wildfires. So, you know, my heart goes out to everybody right now. And I know it's a, a really difficult moment with a lot of hurt in our communities. Uh, I, so, as Jen mentioned, you know, I, I'm the son of a, of a foreign service officer. So I spent a lot of my childhood bouncing around from country to country overseas. I grew up mostly in Europe, and I think that that experience did help inform my worldview. It helped inform the approach I take in this book. You know, I think when you grow up in other countries, you learn to see your own country through the eyes of other people. You learn to see your your own policies in a different way, and you learn a lot about yourself. May I just share? You know, I I was living in Paris with my family uh, just at the end of the Cold War. And then we were in England for a while. And we, the moment we got to England, we actually, it was in the early 90s and the Irish Republican Army, the IRA was uh, ramping up its bombing campaign there. And I was you know, evacuate, evacuated multiple times from, from public buildings with my family. Uh, we had bombings in our neighborhood. It was a really a scary moment, but it also, I think, crystallized for me how these kinds of threats, how sectarian conflict, how, how terrorism can really impact your, your daily life. Uh, and then I, you know, I spent a number of years in England thereafter. And one of the things I got to see was uh, President Clinton's uh, leadership and intervention in the Balkans uh, to try to stop the bloodletting there. And that was a moment when sort of American power was at its apex and it was applied purposefully in the world. Uh, and so I certainly, I remember seeing that was sort of the moment I became very sort of politically aware of what was going on. Uh, but then in later years, uh, I also got to see the contradictions uh, in American power when we went into Iraq. Uh, and then, of course, the, the financial crisis, I was in Belgium at the time and, and got to see that, too. So I think when you're growing up the son of a foreign service officer, you sort of you appreciate your country, you appreciate its values and who you are. You learn about yourself. You learn about the, the limits of power. You, you learn a lot of hard lessons as well. But it definitely served me, uh, I think, well, and it really helped uh, inform my experiences at the State Department and certainly the message I try to share in this book. And it, it, it really informed, I know from talking to you about it, your time as a speechwriter and an advisor to Secretary Kerry. I mean, just to give people um, kind of an inside view, and then I really want to hear you describe it. I mean, it really requires um, being able to understand the policy um, and being able to capture someone's voice and do it with very little sleep, just to kind of double down on what you said about what it's like to travel around the world. So tell us about how you got to know Secretary Kerry and uh, you know what it was like traveling around with him and if there are any memories of moments you had um, where you were particularly under the gun, perhaps. There are a lot of moments where I felt <laughs> yeah. so. You know, it's funny because he, so I started with uh, then Senator Kerry when he was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the U.S. Senate. And I started on, on a whole separate range of issues, mostly focused on human rights. And at some point I, I kind of stumbled into the, the speechwriter portfolio. And I remember, you know, from the very beginning, one of my mentors on the committee told me, they said, you know, Secretary Kerry, Senator Kerry is someone who launched himself with words. You know, when he came back from the Vietnam War, one of the first things he did was testify uh, to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the early 70s about a war gone wrong. And he had these famous words where he said, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? And I think you know he's realized since then how powerful words are and how powerful public rhetoric can be in shaping the story that we tell ourselves, but also that we tell to the world. And it really showed in the kind of care and approach he had to speeches. I mean, even if it was a one minute video statement, you'd be getting a call from him or an email about how the ending could be stronger or there's a different way to make this argument. And so you were working with somebody who really cared about writing. And so that was that was a lot of fun. I mean, I remember my my early experiences speech writing, uh, you know, I you know, where there were times when you think that you're doing a great job, but really you've produced a draft that has a lot of stock <laughs> phrases and cliches, and you learn very quickly how to try to listen to him and try to capture his voice. And I think part of the, you know, just share with uh, listeners today, if they're interested in speech writing, 
part of the challenge isn't just mimicking someone's tone and voice, it's also trying to get inside uh, their head, try to learn about them, how they make arguments. I had to go back and, you know, I read a lot of a, a lot of work from the 60s and 70s, watch movies, you try to learn about them and who they are. But it's a, it's an incredible experience. And I just, I share one thing about uh, writing for him that, that did inform a lot of the book that I, that I write, which is when we were working on a speech many years uh, later when he was secretary, and it was to the UN International School. This is a, a high school that's incredible because it welcomes students from around the world. It's sort of its own mini UN. And it was a tough speech to write because how do you, how do you write a speech that appeals to that many different people from so many different cultures? And one of the things he said to me that really stuck with me, he sort of told me about how his father, Richard Carey, who himself was a diplomat, used to tell him, you know, the art of diplomacy is seeing a country through its eyes through the eyes of its people. And you know, you can tell from, from my early experiences as a son of a diplomat that that resonated with me. And I think it's an approach that Secretary Kerry took quite often is to try to see how problems and challenges looked. And it's funny because you wouldn't necessarily think that trying to take someone else's perspective is a critical task for the US mm -hmm. Secretary of State, but it's hard to think of a foreign policy problem you can solve without it. And so in this book, the reason why I, I talk about big, faithful choices for America and do it by telling the stories of leaders who've wrestled with those choices is I'm trying to learn how to see these problems through the perspective of different people. And I think it, I, I learned a lot doing it. Uh, and it's, I think, a, a powerful way to try to convey the stakes of the moment we're in, uh, which is which is so serious. Uh, and we have you know so many big decisions ahead. So in a way, that's how his, his uh, lessons really informed my approach as well. I will also add on a light note that he was as hard as what Andrew just described is he also was obsessed with missing commas or missing punctuation. So, you know, it was a very challenging job you, you were able to flourish in. Um, so I want to dive into some of the stories that you talk about in the book because they're so interesting and they span um, quite a lot of issues. Um, and I hope some of our questioners, again, you can ask a question by just clicking at the bottom of your screen. You can ask Andrew about anything. Um, but I want to ask you about, you tell a story about um, one of America's intrepid negotiators on North Korea. And what, what people don't know who haven't had the uh, opportunity to kind of travel around or sit in the negotiating room is that these negotiators are doing the work day after day. It is an incredible grind. And then oftentimes, the highest level diplomats or even the president that people know about are the closers really. So tell us about what you learned from him. Take us take us into that negotiating room. Sure thing. I mean, I think this is one of the, the things that I try to convey in this book. In a way, it's it's almost a love letter to diplomacy and to our diplomats because I think they they can never get enough credit because often they they work behind the scenes and it's really hard to to see all the good that they're trying to do in the world and all that they do to protect America and to promote our values. So I tried to tell some of these stories in the book. So this one in particular, this is one of the six choices and the choice itself is persuasion or coercion. It's a question of how does a, how does a great power, a superpower deal with other rising competitors? What's the, mm -hmm. what's the right approach? Whether it's a, it's a big rising competitor like China or whether it's, it's a country like North Korea. And the story I tell is about a diplomat named Robert Gallucci, Bob Gallucci. Mm -hmm. And this is back in the early 90s. And North Korea had announced its intention to withdraw from, from an important multilateral treaty called the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and to kick out inspectors. And this was you know, really important to try to keep a lid on its uh, ambitions nuclear and try to make sure its nuclear program didn't, didn't uh, develop. And so he was called into action, and it was an interesting story because this was right in the middle of a transition between administrations. He was uh, at the tail end of the George H.W. Bush administration, and incoming Clinton administration officials uh, told him at one point, you know, you got to clear out your office and get out. And he, he couldn't believe it, and he tried to press his case with the incoming national security advisor. And not only did he get to keep his job, but then they, they gave him the, the gift of working the North Korea file. <laughs> uh, he, took, he took a little bit of pleasure going back to that transition official and saying, I guess we're going to be working together. And he, he's, a, he's a humble guy. He has a wry sense of humor. Uh, but the, the interesting thing about this portfolio from his perspective is he, he felt he didn't know too much about North Korea. Uh, he didn't speak the language. He felt that they probably needed someone higher profile. But what he, what he was really saying modestly was that they needed somebody who understood nuclear weapons. Uh, mm -hmm. And he really understood the, the mechanics of it, the, the physics behind it. 
And so he took on this task. And one of the first things he told me was that there was sort of a, a two level game going on. On the one hand, he had to deal with the, the strange sort of bureaucratic politics at home, all the different players and actors on the US side who wanted to really, you know, had multiple different objectives when it came to North Korea. And then, of course, he had the incredible, compl inc incredibly complex challenge of dealing with uh, the North Korean nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. And so he's constantly juggling these, these different objectives. And he tells the story of meeting first with uh, the North Korean team in New York and, and describing sort of this, this bizarre image of them coming in with, with enormous uh, ill-fitting suits and then a sort of lapel pin of Kim Il-sung. Uh, and one of the negotiators uh, loved Gone with the Wind and kept saying the phrase, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the dogs bark, but the caravan passes on. And he, he sort of has this very rich, colorful description of, of the scene, but it was a deadly serious uh, negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they were, they were trying to hammer out the details, make sure that the North Koreans came back into the MPT to this treaty, allowed inspectors back in. And fast forward a year or so, and the pressure for military action was really building. And I think people sometimes forget that this was really on the table. Uh, and that we were making, you know, preparations with our military, uh, and it was a serious, serious challenge. And he always had a hard right flank to worry about in the U.S. that didn't really believe that negotiations would get anywhere. And right in the middle of this, uh, President Jimmy Carter makes an appearance, and he had been keeping the former president briefed uh, at the behest of President Clinton. And it turns out that that President Carter was actually invited to North Korea to try to diffuse this challenge. So it's almost a separate track from what they were trying to do. And Bob always, Bob Gallucci says, you know, sort of I wasn't master of the universe. And I think it's a lesson about not only the conflicting objectives that we have to deal with, but surprises along the way when there are these big negotiations. Uh, and it turns out that President uh, Carter had tried to sort of iron out a deal, uh, but some people in Washington weren't so happy about that. And Bob sort of tells this, this story uh, and it, he's kind of caught up in the middle of it completely. Uh, but they tried to push for this agreement and push and push and push. And eventually, uh, in 1994, they, they got an agreement. Uh, but what the real, you know, sort of the real travesty of this tale is that, you know, that's a victory for diplomacy. But as people say about North Korea, it's sort of the land of lousy policy options. It's an incredibly difficult challenge. And, you know, many years later, uh, that, that deal fell, you know, fell through because the North Koreans were starting a uranium enrichment program. You know, we had commitments that we, you know, uh, weren't able to fully follow through on, uh, and there was mutual recriminations, and it got worse from there. And since then, we've seen uh, we've seen it get harder and harder. Uh, and even even sort of presidential symmetry over the last two years certainly hasn't solved it. And uh, so we're we're kind of where we are. And I'm happy to sort of delve into this in more detail if listeners are interested. But to me, this is a sort of a testament to what our diplomatic capabilities were to try to deal with a tough challenge, to try to keep North Korea from breaking out and developing nuclear weapons at the time in the early 90s. And it's tough work and there are always trade-offs involved. And so that's sort of the, the story I'm, I was trying to tell. Oh, well, I hope if people have um, questions about North Korea or anything, um, you know, hit that button, ask a question at the bottom. There's so much to uh, be said about, you know, this issue in particular, but I think one of the things you said is so important for people to remember who are looking for some light in these times, which is that there are a trove of diplomats, foreign service officers, civil servants, who are experts on these issues, who are kind of waiting and prepared for the moment um, when diplomacy will be ripe. And um, hopefully maybe it will be on, at some point in this issue. So let me ask you, Andrew, about another one of the decisions or and, and anecdotes that you talk about in your book. And one of your chapters um, deals with a, an incredibly grave decision, which is whether to send uh, troops into harm's way. And I think, you know, I know President Obama used to say, probably every president says, the hardest thing they do is writing letters to the families of uh, fallen soldiers. Um, you tell a moving story about one young lieutenant in Afghanistan. What did you learn from him? And kind of what's your view on um, how we can prevent getting trapped in costly occupations in faraway lands? What does it mean for our engagement with the Middle East? I think this is I one of the hardest questions in there, so I hope that's okay. No, it's, just, one. it's one of the hardest questions. And so this is, a, for this chapter, uh, it's called core periphery, and it's one of these central choices for a country, which is, you know, do you intervene in faraway lands? You know, when, where, and how should you employ military force? 
And I tell the story of a young lieutenant, his name is Dan Bershinsky, uh, an incredible, an incredible person. And he, I actually met him uh, on a separate issue on the Disabilities Convention when Secretary Kerry was trying to, in the Senate, was actually trying to move this through the Senate. And he eventually tried again uh, when he was Secretary of State. And Dan was a very eloquent uh, advocate for this convention to protect the rights of persons with disabilities, uh, not only here at home, but globally. And Dan was, uh, he grew up in Georgia and he always dreamed about joining the military. His, his brother was Air Force ROTC and he, he wanted to follow in his footsteps, but he wanted to lead troops in action. He wanted to lead in infantry. And one of the interesting things that I, I found talking to Dan, and I've, I've noticed this with, with other folks that I've talked to who have served, is one of the big motivations for him was to be there with other people, to protect them, mm -hmm. uh, to be in solidarity with them when they were fighting. You know, sometimes they're, they're grand ideals when it comes to war, and there's, you know, and then there's, you know, just sort of the on the ground reality of being there side by side with somebody else, uh, protecting and fighting with them. And he went to West Point. And Afghanistan was, was you know, a, a big part of their uh, dinner table conversations. Uh, and it was looming over them, especially as they were graduating and figuring out what they were gonna do. And Dan uh, had his doubts about the war, about, about whether it was the right thing to do, but he wanted to go fight and serve. And he knew that his government had declared it justified and he wanted to go do his part. And so he goes to Afghanistan, uh, 2009, and it is, uh, I think one of the first things he notices is, you know, just sort of the incredible disparity, uh, you know, sort of between where he was coming from and this land very far away, uh, incredibly poor, uh, has suffered sort of brutal internal conflicts. And one of the challenges that he faced, and I, I tell this story in the book, is he, he led these dangerous patrols in areas in the south in Kandahar. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's one of the, imagine being there, you know, you don't have the right counter IED equipment, you don't have bomb sniffing dogs, you never know whether one step will be your, your last step. And he was uh, at the time uh, trying to protect a, a hamlet in the area in, in Kandahar. And I tell one story where he is uh, on a search with his men and they're going through this orchard uh, trying to reach this area. Uh, and they cross uh, an irrigation canal and they cross this bridge uh, and a bomb goes off. and a terrible tragedy and, and Dan lost one of his closest friends and he, he had the suspicion that uh, the Taliban and others were trying to target people with radios and so he carried the radio himself uh, and I, I won't tell the whole story but he uh, experiences some really harrowing things on this uh, on his tour of duty uh, and he came back and he ended up uh, in the hospital getting transported out of Afghanistan into Landstuhl, Germany uh, and then back home to to Walter Reed. And I tell a story of, you know, his dad uh, was there at the hospital and sort of after Dan's eyes opened, the first person he saw was his dad. And his dad asked him, you know, do you know what happened to you? And it wasn't an easy answer for Dan. And I think it touched on a much broader set of questions about uh, America's role in, in peripheral conflicts like this. Uh, and of course, after 9-11, uh, you know, there was an imperative to go after Osama bin Laden and to protect the country. And the question for America is, you know, many, many years later, you know, how do we think about our footprint in these countries overseas? Mm -hmm. And I take a, you know, I take a skeptical look in the book at these interventions and in faraway lands. You know, part of the reason why I incorporate Dan's story is because I do think sometimes there's a, there's a silence, there's a, there's a distance to what's happening. And I think Dan puts a human face on, on some of the very difficult decisions uh, that nobody in our in our decision making in our government takes lightly, but I do take a, a skeptical look. I mean, my sense, if if you look at the historical record, is that the periphery always tempts countries, uh, and it's very easy to get in, but it's very hard to get out, and the costs are exorbitant. And sometimes the costs are are not even evident immediately. Sometimes the costs manifest themselves in vastly growing inequality at home. Uh, the militarization of, of police forces and missed opportunities elsewhere in the world. It's often easy to, to underestimate the power of, of nationalism in other countries. And I think the challenge I face with this because, and I, I just shared this because no choice is easy. And, and in the book, I try to make that point is that sometimes if you avoid the periphery and leave it all together, sometimes problems fester and they can come back to haunt you. You know, you can have other powers intervene and gain an advantage. You can have it become a failed state and sometimes it, it might even host a threat like terrorists and they can come uh, hit you at home. And so there are real trade-offs uh, at stake. But my sense, 
uh, and coming from someone who worked at the State Department, is that we don't always make a mistake when we when we employ military force because sometimes it's necessary, but we do make a mistake when we reach for the military tool first and give short shrift to the power of diplomacy, development, and development finance to attend to some of the root causes of these conflicts. And I think more investment in preventative diplomacy and development could make a real difference. It won't solve all these problems. But you know, I think, for example, a girl with a book is one of the most powerful forces in the world. Uh, and one statistic I just share that I saw is that if you double primary school enrollment, you can have the risk of civil war. And that, you know, there's a question of, you know, how are we balancing our national security toolkit at home? And are we investing in the right things to keep us safe for the long term? So it's just one of the one of the issues that I raised in that chapter. It's certainly, you know, perspectives on all sides. But I think Dan's story shares some important lessons about this. Yeah, it's a really beautiful story. And diplomacy backed by the threat of military force. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you use it, but it can be powerful, especially for from the from the United States. So I wanted, you mentioned 9-11, and obviously that's a moment in our history that, um, you know, changed the course of national security for a period of time, maybe for the long term, um, that's arguable. But I wanted to ask you about, you know, something you referenced, which is a conversation with Nick Burns, um, who's a very well-respected um, former diplomat, um, national security expert about our alliances. Um, and. I want to frame it in just sort of where we are with our alliances today, uh, because as I think people who are tuning in here are very well aware, um, you know, President Trump has spent the last few years denigrating our alliances, suspending military exercises, threatening to withdraw U.S. troops from key allies. But a lot of people in the United States think he has a point. I mean, what's the point of alliances? Why do we need these people? So talk a little bit about your view on that and kind of what you learned from the perspective of someone like Nick Burns about that period post 9-11. Yeah, I think, I think this is a central question. So to, to put it in the frame of the, the whole book, you know, we've talked about sort of the persuasion or coercion choice. We've talked about core periphery. This is another big choice for the country, which is allies or autonomy. You know, do you, do you bind yourself to other countries, deepen those friendships and, and try to wield them effectively in a world where you don't want to be isolated or alone or do you cast those allies aside in the hope that you might be able to conserve resources and have more flexibility in the way that you conduct yourself overseas? It's a big, it's a big question for America right now, Jen, just like you said, because I think uh, you know, there have been real pressures on our alliances over the last couple of years. And I think people can fairly ask, you know, well, why are they important? Why do they matter? I, so I tell the story of, of Nicholas Burns, and he's one of our, our great diplomats, and he was, uh, on, at the time of 9-11, just to sort of pick up the thread from Dan Brzezinski's story, he was ambassador to NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, one of our most important military alliances in the world. And when 9-11 when happened, the day after, uh, Nick Burns placed a call to then National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice and said, our allies want to invoke what, what's called Article 5. It's this mutual defense mechanism that basically says, you know, an attack against one is an attack against all. And it, it it's really, it hadn't been invoked before. And this was a historic decision and he needed the president's approval. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I tell Nick's story about how he grew up uh, during the Cold War and Vietnam, the conflict in Vietnam was always a big part of his family uh, dinner table conversations, weighed on his community. And he always knew that war represents the failure of diplomacy but he also knew that sometimes wars need to be fought if, uh, you know, if your your nation and values are, are at stake, like at World War II. Uh, and so he was trying to navigate this. And one of the things that he discovered along the way was that America's network of alliances is one of the most important advantages that we have in the world today. Now, during dur during the uh, after the attacks in 9/11, one of the ambassadors at NATO, the Canadian ambassador, turned to him and said, "You know, Nick, have you thought about?" invoking Article 5 so we can all come to your support. Uh, and he worked with this ambassador with his other, uh, the other permanent representatives to marshal the entire alliance behind this effort. And when Americans woke up uh, on the morning of September 12th, they heard the message that our allies were there with us. And what was so moving about this is that in many ways, if you look to history, the assumption was always that America would come back to Europe, to Europe's defense. You know, we did it. We did it twice uh, in the 20th century. We'd come back again, but it turns out, you know, that they actually were coming to our aid. And for many, many years in Afghanistan and elsewhere, they've they fought by our sides, 
uh, many have died. Uh, and this is really sort of a testament to what the NATO alliance has done, but I think it's a there's a broader point here. So one of the one of the well-known lines in history that that I cite in the book is by uh, President uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and he quotes uh, the, the writer Emerson when he says, "You know, if you want to have a friend, you have to be a friend." And I think the question for America today is, you know, are we a good friend, and can we count on friends in the world, or are we more isolated than ever? You know, there's a recent Pew poll that just came out. That said that our approval, you know, people how our key allies see us uh, is at its lowest point in in two decades, and mm -hmm. that's really troubling because our allies do so much for us. You know, they they basically help us extend our influence in the world. They they lend troops, they lend specialized capabilities. They through them we've been able to restrain countries from developing nuclear weapons. We've had enormous economic benefits, and they help keep the peace. And I think one of the things that's hard to always see with our allies and with the work of diplomats is that often the work is invisible and its success rests on counterfactuals. You know, the things that didn't happen, the arms races that didn't break out, yeah. the conflicts that didn't spiral out of control. And this is a really hard story to tell, but I think it puts a premium on really sharing this story with America and with the world, because I think diplomacy is part of the great American journey. And I do think that there are some incredible intrepid diplomats who carry our values to the world, but also do so much to keep us safe. You know, many of our diplomats right now are working to make sure that there isn't a future virus that doesn't become another global pandemic and shut down an economy. They're working on uh, food security issues uh, for our farmers at home. Uh, and if, you know, if you're in the, in the store and you're trying to buy a product, you want to make sure it's not made with human trafficking, with modern day slavery, you know, we've got diplomats and development experts working on that too. And our alliances are help are one way, it's a vehicle for us to project influence and to work on all these important problems. And so for me, Nick Burns' story is sort of a, a real life sort of modern sort of tale of uh, you know, leadership through by with and through our allies and showing what it means to be a good friend in the world. And I think it's an important time to remember because sometimes that history seems pretty distant, but it it really has relevance for us today. And you touched on this. Well, I'm just going to give people another prompt to ask a question because we're going to take questions soon. So it's very easy. Just click the little box at the bottom. It says ask a question. You can type it in there. Um, I want to ask you, you, you wrote this book and you mentioned coronavirus. Um, you wrote this book before the pandemic hit. Um, a lot of people, um, including people who um, may not even be supporters of President Trump, don't see it as an international issue, right? People see it as a domestic issue and one where we need a vaccine for Americans. Talk a little bit about how the arguments in your book, um, I know you wrote this before the pandemic, are kind of challenged or reaffirmed by what we've seen and, and what we need to do moving forward. This is, I mean, in a way, we are in the middle of a fog of crisis right now, and it's it's so hard to kind of see where we're going to go. But the devastation has been absolutely abundant and clear, and it's it's extraordinarily distressing. And we can see how important our public administration is, how important government is, how important state capacity is. I mean, we're we're, we're living the consequences right now, and I think. It just goes back to this point of, you know, who do we value in our workforce and what kind of stories do we tell to make sure that everybody knows how important it is to have effective, agile government so that we can, you know, make sure that things like this don't ever happen again. Uh, so in terms of the pandemic, you know, I, I so part of me looks back to history to try to situate, you know, how we can expect the, the future to be. And if you go back into history, you know, there are some cases from the Peloponnesian War, from Venice in the 17th century, from the, from the Black Death in the Middle Ages, you know, there's a whole tale in history about how pandemics have completely shifted the way a country's power is in the world. And the question is, are we going to see that same kind of dramatic upheaval in terms of our position globally that we did when you look back into the, the centuries past in history? You know, I think the picture is, is murky, but I do think that there are some clarifying truths about what we've seen. Now, if you start on the home front, I do think that this was more than just an epidemiological virus. It was a social virus, an economic virus, a political virus. It really held up a mirror to our society and revealed some troubling things about our social inequities, about racial injustice and discrimination, about divisions between urban and rural, our political dysfunction, 
so there's a lot that we need to fix at home. And many of these problems predated the pandemic and have only been accelerated by it. And so I think it puts a premium on like, what is our social compact at home? And who do we value? Which workers do we value? How do we make sure that we prepare for the future? And I think that that question about the home front uh, and the social compact is really one of the big lessons that I take away. Another one that I'd take away is just globally, I do think of COVID-19 as sort of the third big crisis in the post-Cold War period. You know, we had the security crisis in 9-11. We had a financial and economic crisis in 2008. And in a way, now we have a massive public health crisis that's become a security and economic crisis unto itself. So it's an incredibly complicated problem. I think people are looking to see, you know, does, is democracy going to fare well? Is autocracy, is China going to do better? I think the picture is complicated because, uh, you know, you see some democracies like, like ours stumbling, but, but Germany, South Korea, Taiwan, other places have done well. China stumbled in the beginning, but its economy is picking up. And so I think it's a complicated picture, but for me, I, I do think there's a way forward, which is you know, we need to make sure that our institutions globally are reformed, improved and adapted, and they need to be more agile. Because like you said, Jen, when there is a vaccine developed, it can't be a free for all, a race to the bottom. We have to do much more to coordinate internationally on vaccines, on therapeutics, on rapid response and scalable infrastructure. We know this is gonna happen again. Uh, and so we have to prepare for a future that's that's already here. Uh, and the last thing I just say, uh, and I think this ties into all of our discussions about diplomacy and development, is what do we really mean by national security? You know, I think it's obviously critical that we have a strong military, but what does it mean when a pandemic, you know, kills you know, almost two, 200,000 Americans, uh, shuts down our economy? And right now, if you look at how we spend our money, you know, the estimates vary, but I saw one estimate that said that we spent about two, three billion dollars on infectious disease, but 180 billion on counterterrorism. Now, counterterrorism is, is really important. We have to do that work. But is it that many times more important than a pandemic that has killed so many Americans uh, and really destabilized the whole world? We have to make sure that our there's a balance in our national security toolkit and that we're making sure that those interests are represented at the table so that we can be uh, strong for the future. So an enormous challenge with no good answers, but I do think that there's a, a roadmap that we had in place uh, during the Obama administration on pandemic disease. And I think that there's a place that we can get back to where we're really investing in pre pandemic preparedness and response so that we're strong for the future uh, and don't have to go through this kind of thing again. I, I want to take a question. I'm going to come back because I want to ask you about China. So keep that in your back pocket. Um, so in reference, Andrew, to your upbringing abroad, I wonder if you might be able to talk about how other countries perceive American history. As we grapple with our history and try to understand it better, it sometimes feels like we need an outsider perspective. I wonder if that's changed too, but I'll let you take that any way you want to. Yeah, I think, well, I think this is really interesting. I mean, for, for me, when I, when I look at sort of our history from overseas, one thing I think you see is that we have a lot of competing ideas for who we are as a nation. And I think right now that we're in the middle of a big argument about who we are. And I think there's a story that really resonates overseas. And that story is that America is founded on an idea. It's not founded on a, on a religion or a bloodline, but it's this idea of a sort of the world's most inclusive uh, multiracial democracy. Uh, and that's, that's an idea that we've always fallen short on. But I think it's an idea that, that attracts so many people from around the world to try to come here uh, you know, as the last best hope. And I think there is, that, there is that sort of dream that's still alive overseas. But I think in the last couple of years, especially, you know, that dream has been overshadowed in a way by lots of developments that I think have really distressed and troubled the world. I mean, America's democracy at home really does send a message to the world. One of the things that I learned at the State Department is that the power of our example is more important than the example of our power. And right now at home, you know, we're a democracy in trouble and we, you know, we need to deal with questions of uh, rampant social inequality, discrimination, uh, racial justice, uh, climate resilience. I mean, these are the kinds of things that on the one hand, they seem like domestic policy choices and they are, but they have ripple effects across the world in terms of how other countries see us. And so if we're thinking about an agenda for, for moving forward, one of the things I'd say is I think we need sort of greater resilience uh, at home and we need solidarity with democracies in the world. And that means revitalizing the purpose of democracy and showing that we understand nothing's inevitable 
and that there are many competing ideas for the country, but that we're willing to fight for and reclaim that best of our tradition, which is an America that's about we the people, that enlarges that definition and tries to aspire to that, that view of sort of an inclusive, multiracial, multiethnic democracy, uh, which has always been sort of, I, I think, as someone who grew up overseas, the, the quality that inspires the most people. But I think the world is really looking and wondering whether America will reclaim that promise again. And, and, and a somber message is that I don't think they're going to keep looking forever. You know, I think at some point people make decisions and they say, can we really rely on America to go back to that quote, you know, to have a friend, you have to be one. You know, I think we have to really ask ourselves hard questions about our role in the world and the kind of friend we want to be to other countries at a time when, you know, there's so much turbulence overseas. Yeah, good. Good, good, good perspective. Um, I think to offer people in this in the times we're living through, um, we need to do a little introspection before we start pointing fingers sometimes, uh, especially in diplomacy. So I wanted to ask you. I mean, there are a few trickier, thornier issues than China and our the U.S. relationship with China, and it's become quite a political issue. And not long before this year, um, but it's long been a political issue. But in the wake of COVID and, you know, a, a, a rising China, um, how do we navigate the path forward? I mean, how do we, what kind of cooperation is possible? Because we need to work with China on issues like climate change and of course on addressing pandemics, but uh, there are also areas where we have uh, concerns, aggressions in the South China Sea and other places. What is that, what should that relationship look like moving forward? I, th I think you, you said it, Jen, to me that the central challenge is how do we manage and shape a deteriorating U.S.-China relationship in a way that protects our core interests and values, but doesn't court disaster or, or forfeit the opportunity to cooperate on these big global problems like climate change and, and pandemics. I think, you know, in a way this ties into a, one of the last choices I look at in the book, which is this choice of open or closed. Uh, and in many ways, this goes back to a, to an event in, in 2001 when the, when China entered the World Trade Organization. And in a way, it was this big shock to the system. And I think many, many countries struggled to adapt, but the America especially. Uh, and there's always been this debate, you know, we've been engaging China for a long time, you know, since the late 1970s, uh, when we had normalized relations with China, engagement's sort of been our go-to policy in the hope that China would become what was called a responsible stakeholder. And engagement always had sort of a deterrence dimension, always had this, you know, approach where it wasn't just about cooperation, it was also about competition. There was always that mix. But I do think right now we are in the middle of a debate and a new consensus forming that we need a much sharper, more competitive approach. And some people even go farther and say we need a confrontational approach. We need sort of a, a new containment. And I think sometimes we are stuck between these polarities of engagement or containment. And I think a wiser middle ground approach is a shaping strategy. And what I mean by that is, and I think this is a lesson I learned from another one of America's great diplomats, uh, Bill Burns, who was our, uh, he was an ambassador to Russia. He was also our deputy, uh, deputy US Secretary of State. So um, he's a really knowledgeable, legendary figure in diplomacy. And he would say that on China, you know, instead of trying to shape its internal trajectory, and in my view, I think you know, trying to do that is unlikely to be successful. We should try to shape the environment into which it rises. And I think we can do that. I mean, we have a whole range of tools to try to shape that environment. We have our allies and partners in the Asia Pacific. We have new partners like India, and I think could do a lot more in Southeast Asia. We could link arms with them and try to help build an order in Asia that has a different kind of balance, that's less China-centric. We could try to forge high standards for new technologies like AI and 5G that have so much potential for our economies, but they also have risks and implications that we have to manage. We can get back into the business of forming high standard trade agreements, but this time do it in a way that protects and supports our middle class at home. Uh, and so there's a whole range of tools that we can have. And my sense is that on this question of China, which is incredibly complicated and in a way that you know easy answers are hard to come by but i do think a shaping strategy where we're thinking about our comparative advantages and strengths is really important and the last thing i would just say is that instead of letting the competition with china distract us from our purpose i do think we need to first and foremost invest in ourselves and shore up our own economic competitiveness and resilience and that of our allies because i think if we start there 
we're a confident nation and we can cooperate then with China from strength on the issues that we care about, like climate and pandemics. And we can also recognize that at the end of the day, if this is a contest of models, we need to make sure that we're living up to our democratic principles at home and showing that we have a clear contrast and an alternative. And that's what I mean by resilience at home and greater solidarity with democracies in the world, because I do think our values matter in our foreign policy and leading with those is important, but leading with those smartly and not letting it become an ideological crusade. So I do think this shaping strategy presents a middle ground and that's, that's what I'd offer on this hard topic. So Andrew, I'm just gonna uh, take another question here. Uh, it seems like there is so much nuance in diplomacy. That's absolutely true. Can you talk about an experience when there was a faux pas that made a big difference in a negotiation mission? Hmm. Putting you on the spot a little bit, but you know, hopefully there are some examples. Well, let me let me say this. Uh, you know, there there are a whole range of protocols and delicacies in diplomacy, and the opportunities for for miscalculation, misinterpretation are quite common. And part of diplomacy is showing respect for another country. Uh, and so, and I can say from, as a former speechwriter, one of the interesting things that I went through was that when you write speeches in the US Senate, in a way you're writing just for a constituency, you're just writing for your state in a way, even though you're as a Senator, you know, you're speaking for the country. So when I wrote for Senator Kerry, his voice uh, was, was a national voice, but you're, you're also writing for his home constituency. When you go to write for a secretary of state, your constituency is the country and you're telling your country's story to the world. But what's so interesting is that when you go to another country, you are also sharing their story with them. You're telling their country's story as a sign of respect to show that you care about who they are, what their traditions are, and hopefully you find some meeting points between your national story and theirs. And that's where the real magic of diplomacy happens. I mean, I can share one, one brief anecdote from my own is that uh, I remember a trip to Sri Lanka. It's a very small faux pas, but these kinds of things can, can matter. And there are always challenges around phonetics with uh, different places. And so one of the jobs of a speechwriter is to make sure that you are paying attention to those phonetics, that you're talking to the right people and getting the right facts. And we were, uh, Secretary Kerry was giving a speech about the future of US-Sri Lanka relations. Uh, and there had been, uh, you know, there had been a war there, a civil war there. Uh, there was, you know, a uh, need to invest in reconciliation. Uh, and it was an important moment and an important uh, visit for, for Sri Lanka. And uh, there, was a, there was a phrase at the top of the speech that, that we had put in in the local language and a thank you to the institute that was hosting us. And I, you know, I thought I put in my homework and got the, uh, got the phonetic right. But it turned out that the phonetic was not right, and the person who let me know that was the was the foreign uh, foreign minister of Sri Lanka. Uh, <laughs> so it was a bit, it was a humbling a humbling experience, and also teaches you that even these small details matter a lot, and you have to you have to get them right. And uh, so just you know you do your best the next time. But it's even those small things. I think that's what might be interesting for people is that even these these one lines at the beginning of a speech do really matter. And so your words are watched very closely uh, when, you're, when you're a speechwriter, when you're a diplomat. Uh, it's something that I thrived on and I loved, but there are these stories that always are, are humbling and remind you of the, the lessons. Absolutely. I, I will add, and I encourage people, we have just a few minutes left to ask a question if you have one. Um, I will just share one anecdote. The first uh, foreign trip that President Obama did um, was it to I believe it was to Saudi Arabia um, or, one, or not the first foreign trip but one of the first trips he did to Saudi Arabia. Um, the senior staff when they went back to their rooms, many of them had these briefcases full of jewels that were in their rooms, and this is something that often happens where foreign governments who are hosting you will leave gifts and provide gifts and. Um, I think the most sophisticated ones know that you can't keep them. It's still kind of a sign of, it could be a power play, could be a sign of welcome. You know, there's lots of ways to analyze it. But, um, you know, it was the first exposure that a lot of these staffers had had to kind of this journey. So they go back to their hotel rooms and there's like a briefcase of earrings, watches, necklaces, everything. And they learn the hard way that the secret is these all have to be given back because US law doesn't allow you to accept them. And there's basically a vault where all these things are, um, which is kind of an interesting part of diplomacy. But um, 
So let me take, oh, we have good two questions here, Andrew. Um, Andrew, did you work with Secretary Kerry during his presidential bid? And if so, what was that like? How did it change him, if at all? So the, the short answer is I didn't work with them. Uh, and even if I were, the, the, there's a strict line between what you can do if you're working on policy questions in the Senate or the State Department and his campaign. But one thing I can share uh, that I, I read about, I watched him, uh, is that I think when you run for president, you get a sense of the scale of the country in a way that's that's very hard to do in any other experience. You get a sense of how big, how diverse the country is. And in a way, whenever I wrote for him, I always sort of felt like he had many stories, many levels in his mind, many, many concerns. Uh, and I think it, it taught me that decision makers sometimes see things from a completely different perspective. Uh, and when you're when you're one of the staffers, you know you're worried about your your one issue. I've got a speech to write, or I work I work on this one portfolio. But the the amount of information coming at these senior leaders, uh, the concerns that they have, the experiences they've had, sometimes take place on a on a different plane. And at your job to try to support them is to ask yourself, you know, how can I try to put myself in their shoes? Try to imagine uh, that there's these larger concerns at stake. And can I can I write a speech in a way? Can I write a memo in a way that speaks to that? And I think I think running for president actually really helped uh, Secretary Kerry as a diplomat because you realize a first the country you're representing and the stories that are at stake, that the hope and the hurt in the communities you you carry that with you, and the second is that I do think having an understanding of politics, having an understanding that everybody has a need for an explanation, helps you as a negotiator because when you're negotiating. Uh, you know, maximalist approach is my way or the highway, you know, usually doesn't work. You have to recognize that either there needs to be some sort of compromise and that compromise isn't capitulation, you know, and then that's that's the art of diplomacy. Yeah. I think Kerry, Secretary Kerry always knew this, always had this in the back of his mind. Yeah, that's such a good point. I also saw him use his failed run for president, sometimes talking to foreign leaders who needed to um, needed kind of a pep talk or a better understanding that he understood the politics they were navigating as well. One politician to another. All politics is lo local, even globally. So mm -hmm. this is a great question to end on, Andrew. Uh, could you please recap the choices referenced in the title? And just as a reminder, you can click, there's a big green button you can cl click to buy the book um, that should be on your screen. Um, certainly encourage people to do that. So a recap uh, of the of the choices. Sure, sure. So choice, the first choice that I talk about is core periphery, this question of where and when should America intervene in faraway land, should it at all? And what are the costs? How can it manage it better? So that's the first choice, and I and I tell the story of that that young uh, soldier in, in Afghanistan. The second choice is is what I call butter or guns, and this is this question of you know how should we invest? Should we invest more in things like education, science and technology, infrastructure, or should we try to invest more in the military? And the, and the challenge here is that it's not really an either or choice. It's about setting the balance between them, and if you set that balance well, you tee yourself up for long term and sustainable economic growth, which can support a country's power and position in the world. But if you get it wrong, I think it's a recipe for national decline. So it's that's a really tough challenge. And I tell the story of a great innovator, a woman who led one of our one of our great innovation efforts in the government. Uh, and she has a, a wonderful story about, about her, her childhood and why she wanted to become an engineer. And then the next choice is allies or autonomy. This question, you know, which allies are worth dying for? Why do alliances matter? And how can we adapt our alliances to meet new challenges today? And so I tell the story of, of Nick Burns uh, and his diplomacy after 9-11. Uh, and then the next choice after that is persuasion or coercion. So how do you manage a rising power, rising competitor? What are the wise approaches? Uh, and there I tell the story uh, of Bob Gallucci, like we talked about earlier. Uh, and then the next choice is what I call people power or pinstripe rule. This is actually a, a choice that I, I thought about how long and hard, which is this question of corruption, not just corruption on the home front, but corruption coming from abroad, strategic networks of corruption, dark money that's flowing from abroad into our politics. I think this has real implications. If you look at the historical record, so many countries end up in decline because uh, corruption takes over. People think that their personal interests are the national interests. Uh, and it, it has consequences. And so I, I tell the story of a, a remarkable anti-corruption activist and scholar 
who has interpreted ancient myths for modern times. And she's a really, really interesting character. And then the final choice is open or closed. You know, do we want to try to build a system uh, where trade is sustainable for the middle class, where we're promoting investment overseas, where we're promoting a foreign policy that works for our middle class at home and shores up that social compact I talked about in light of COVID? And so these are the six big choices. Uh, and I do tell them through the eyes of a leader for each one. But one thing I haven't shared with all of you is that for each one, I also reach back into history and ask whether other countries have been here before and what we can learn from them. Because I do think, you know, as, as the child of a diplomat living overseas, I do care about uh, how other countries are, are faring and what we can learn from them. And I, I do think there are many lessons from the past that we can apply in, in the present. Uh, and I just say, if we're, if we're closing things out, that uh, one of the things that I, I take away from this project is, you know, I do have a sense of weathered, sort of a weathered optimism about our prospects as a country. Uh, even though I've, I've spent these past years studying the rise and fall of nations, you know, I do have this optimism in part because of the stirring for racial justice and equality in our streets. And I think that people are really striving for a better part of, of the American story. And one of the, the, the most eloquent proponents of this aspiration was the late Congressman John Lewis. And I think that he really summed up this aspiration well. He said, democracy is not a state, it's an act. And I do think that this construct of choice is really important. You know, we have fateful choices to make. And I do think citizens all across the country and political leaders have a responsibility to make the, to make the right choices, to put in the hard work of citizenship, to help make our country better, more promising, more fair, more just. And I do think that we have the opportunity to do that in the coming months and years, but nothing is guaranteed. And so I do think it really comes down to, you know, are we going to, uh, reach for a higher ground on this. And and that's why I wrote the book, because my hope is that we can. Well, for anyone who's been watching, I can just say Andrew is one of the most beautiful writers, human beings, thinkers, and I, for one, hope to see him as like a big prominent diplomat one day, not saying he's told me he wants to do that, but it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you and really hear some creative and thoughtful thinking. And again, just really encourage people to buy and read this um, wonderful book. Thank you so much, Jen. Such a pleasure to be in conversation with you and with, with everybody in the Town Hall Seattle community. Yeah, thank you both so much for um, this program. I found it so interesting and I am always encouraged to hear someone say that we still have diplomats waiting in the wing to <laughs> come in and, and sort of reestablish our uh, relationships in the world. So um, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching tonight. Um, again, uh, we have Elliot Bay linked in the buy the book button here. So go right to that page uh, and you can purchase Andrew's book. If you want to follow more Town Hall content, you can click the follow button at the top right corner of your screen uh, and see what's coming up. Um, and we'll see you again. Thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you. Take care, everybody.